I'm watching some of my friends in the name of I got a word from the Lord end up in these really crazy situations. And I'm like, we're going to have to back up and ask ourselves, like, how do we judge prophetic words? Because it can't just be, is it biblical or not? Because I could say tons of things that are biblical, but they're actually not prophetic for, for your purpose. Welcome to Cultural Catalyst, where we teach you to learn how to live fully alive, co-labor with God, and change the world. And we are doing a mini-series on prophetic pioneers because we are moving towards the School of the Prophets with Ben Armstrong and Dano McCollum. So welcome, guys. Good to be with you, Chris. Yes. Yeah, thank you. We're excited. Yes, we are. And uh, hey, we're stepping into a new era what have you sensed in the seismic season shift? Dano, you and I had a little conversation in our last first session of the mini series. Ben, why don't you open with what are you sensing for this new seismic shift? Well, the, the big thing I'm sensing is a new uh, value for union with Christ. Uh, where I know uh, what's, what's his name, Lou Engel has been prophesying uh, a communion revival. Yes. And to me, that communion revival isn't just valuing the blood and the broken body of Christ and, and taking communion. It is a portion of that, but it's, it is a, a little bit of that 1 Corinthians 11 where Paul is correcting the church in Corinth and saying, guys, you're not actually valuing what what the communion meal is all about. It's all about connection with God and connection with the body, with one another. And out of that union flows all of the best of the gifts of the Holy Spirit because they're abiding with the Holy Spirit. So I feel like we are moving into a place of union with God where the power of God can be trusted in us. If we're rooted and grounded in love, I believe God can trust us with supernatural power, with uh, ex uh, the wisdom of Christ, the wisdom that transforms not only uh, our families, but our whole societies. And I believe we're stepping into that. God's starting with that, hey, let's get right in connection with him. Let's get right in connection to family, the body of Christ. And from that place, we're going to actually receive the wisdom of heaven, the mind of Christ. And when we have those two in place, that's when I believe the supernatural power of God is released uh, in an incredible way. So, yeah, I just feel like uh, he is exposing us to levels of glory and levels of his goodness and his nature. And I don't think we should leave that spot. I think we need to be in that spot. And those, those, feet, those things, I mean, right now we're facing things around the globe that really does need the mind of Christ. It, it needs wisdom. It, it, needs, uh, it needs the power of God to shift those things. And so I, I believe we're stepping into that season. We, we've started it. I believe that shift actually started in late 2019. And uh, there's been a warfare season. I love your word about halftime. And we're, about, we're almost halfway through this decade. And I believe God has been on a decade. And, uh, and I, I really believe it's, it's going to take a whole decade to shift things because God isn't just doing things in the United States of America. I think he's actually doing things globally. And when it's that scale, it might take a little more time than we're used to. So those are a few things that I'm feeling. And 
excited about and pumped about, but yeah, common union. Yeah. Common union where you've come, we've come here to lay down our life. I always say marriage is a death march to a life camp and we're in this marriage with the Lord. And, you know, and, uh, you know, in in, uh, first Corinthians 11, he goes on to say, some of you are weak, some sick, and some even dying because you misjudge the body. Yeah, and yeah. and I and I, I don't think that's saying like you have bad judgments about the body. You think people are evil or something. I think the Lord sends help through the body. You know, like he he sends you know Joe to pray for my sickness, but but I misjudge Joe. I just see Joe past present. I don't know Ju- Joe future present, and so I don't anticipate a powerful expression of God through through him because I've misjudged him. And therefore, yeah, God yeah, sent me friends. someone to encourage me, but I stayed weak because I didn't let Joe in my life. God sent someone to heal me, but I didn't get healed because I didn't, I didn't have a value for Jane in my life. I only saw her as uh, uh, in, her, in, in the flesh, in, in her human side. I, I, I have a, a, a terminal disease and, and God, sh- God sent Henry to deliver me from my terminal disease, but I only saw Henry after the yeah. flesh. And therefore, yeah. I didn't actually receive the healing that he was carrying for me, or the deliverance, or the restoration, or the courage, or the direction, because I misjudged the body. Yeah. And I think this is a big part of the communion revival that we're a part of is that we're seeing each other future present. And so the prophetic element of the communion revival is so in, in, incredibly central to this new era because part of the era that's opening up is I'm knowing the Lord the way he is, not the way I used to see him. Yep. And and that and therefore it's opening up a new direct a new way of viewing the people I've always known. And thus That's we're so inviting good, people in their divine destiny. I think it's pretty profound, really. Yeah, yeah. I love that. I, I believe that this is a huge part of prophetic uh, community is yeah. knowing one another after the spirit rather than after the natural. And, and you know, there's no way that your past will not be the prophet of your future if you don't have a more compelling future than defining past. And that compelling future uh, you know, the way we really live in this common unity is to see uh, the treasure that God has deposited in each person. I know in, in 2 Corinthians 5, they said, you know, so from now on, we regard no one from an earthly point of view. Though we used to know Christ that way, we do so no longer. For if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. We like to talk about, you know, our new creation but we haven't really applied it to how we do community and and seeing one another future present, as you've said, or to see one another after the spirit uh, rather than after uh, just the earthly performance. And and this way we get to not only call one another out, we get to call one another up Oof. into there you go. the higher nature that that Christ has established in us. You know, it's, yeah, uh, I, I love this saying. Uh, the first time I heard uh, Danny, it's it's not a Danny quote, but he he quoted it in a message. A man without a vision is a man without a future, and a man without a future will always return to his past. So here's another part of this communion revival: as we begin to judge each other after after their prophetic destiny, as opposed to after their pathetic past, is that we're actually <laughs> releasing vision on people, right? And as we release vision on people, a person with a vision will have pain in their life just like a person without vision. You can't you can't get you can't get around the fact that in the world we'll have tribulation. But a person person with a vision re- will realize that their their pain has a purpose. Like vision gives pain a purpose. But a person without a vision will always return to their past. Yeah. And I think this is really huge. It's a big part of what the prophetic people bring not just to not just to church culture, but to culture. Ben, um, what are some of the common challenges churches face in cultivating a healthy prophetic culture in their churches? 
Yeah, I, I think there's quite a few challenges. I, I, I think what, one of the challenges we faced at Bethel was the idea that we are an international culture and we draw people from all over the world with all, all kinds of different backgrounds and all kinds of different denominational experiences, life experience, family experience, which means we potentially could have, uh, you know, whatever thousands of people that we have here in our environment, all coming from a different perspective on the prophetic. And although we may have a prophetic culture, it's super important to actually create a prophetic community where we train and equip. So I think a lot of people just expect, oh, we're just going to empower people in the prophetic and don't actually train them in what we're expecting and what we, uh, what, what, what our church or our specific movement, what our DNA is. So we, we talk about theological protocols and DNA protocols Theological, no one gets to argue that. That's the Bible. So we're just teaching foundations in the Bible. And right now, I tell you what, you guys know this just as much as I do. Some of the foundations in the Bible, this generation has never heard. They've just never heard it. It's not, it's not that they're, they're bad or they're ignoring it. They've never been trained in some of the foundations. That's why I love your, your word, Chris, about going back to the old gym some of these foundational truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have a bunch of infants. And, and that's not a derogatory term. It's just a, a growth term. They're, they're infants, and they need to learn the foundational things. So don't assume that your community knows all this stuff and then punish them when they don't get it right every time. I think we need an environment that trains and equips and then freeze them up to try it out. Now, I just came back from some trips in Europe, and uh, I noticed a, a big thing in a, in a culture that really empowers the prophetic. Sometimes the prophetic can dominate. And, and what I mean by that is uh, this specific moment, uh, we had worship going on, and all throughout worship, it was a nonstop train of prophetic people coming up to the leader to tell the leader what God was doing in the room. And then the leader never worshiped, never got an opportunity to worship, and then was concerned about giving all of the words. And I, I don't want that to dominate as well. So it's a normal thing where we start elevating the prophetic and then we get excited because God's doing stuff. In a room, of course he is. It's infinite what he's doing. And, and we've just told people, you can hear the voice of God. And, and now we, we want to validate their gifts. But at the same time, we need to, everyone to realize, hey, sometimes God shows you what he's doing. He's not trying to get you to do something about it. And then also, uh, we need to have priorities in a worship service when we're applying the prophetic and doing things. Worships, you know, that's about God. That's his time. And my job is to worship in that space and not just get distracted and wowed by what he's doing and then try and get my word in. So having some protocols for the, for that is, is really, really big. And I think uh, as we continue to grow, I think there's still a ton of places that have been wounded by the prophetic. And so we have to be patient. We have to be really patient and kind with people who have been wounded by the prophetic. And then we've got to set up structures that help protect our people and protect the sheep, you know, from that wounding. And so some people don't like rules when it comes to the prophetic, but I think they're actually vital to have good boundaries, good protocols and and those things that are going on. Um, I think if we're going to create prophetic communities and grow this in our church environments, we, we have to value it from the top down. And uh, when we value that, it gives permission, but having regular feedback is going to be really important. What do you that. think some of the guardrails are 
you know, you're talking right now about, you know, you know, rules or policies or protocols, maybe depending on, you know, what, what we're exactly how we're emphasizing it. Ben, what do you yeah. think some of the, you know, what do you think some of the, what do you think some of the guardrails are for healthy prophetic ministry? You're talking about, you know, you're talking about some things that are unhealthy and, and how the overemphasis of prophetic ministry can actually take away from the, the central theme of Jesus being at the center. What do you think some of the guardrails are for prophetic ministry? Well, you know, we start in in 1 Corinthians, uh, and we talked a little bit about 1 Corinthians 11, starting with union with God, an abiding relationship, because if you abide in him and he abides in you, you bear much fruit, not much gifts. So we're not gift focused. Um, those are good guardrails that we're, we're focusing on the fruit of the Holy Spirit against these things. There is no law. If we're focused on those. We're focused on love. First Corinthians 13 really lays that out really good. Um, Paul readjusts the heart posture and then uh, the foundations and guardrails of first Corinthians 14 verse three. But the one who prophesies prophesies for strengthening encouragement and the comfort of another and making sure in our environments we're differentiating between uh, the gift of prophecy, which everyone can do and operate in and should do and operate in and the office of a prophet, you know, direction, correction, warnings, all of those things come from what it starts from mothers and fathers. And, you know, I, I, I like just anchoring people in, in that first is, how do you become a mother and father? Um, some of the uh, real important things that we, we do that are kind of DNA protocols, we say no dates, no mates, and no babies. Now, we're not trying to stop people from exercising word of knowledge. We love dates, but if I said, Dano, uh, God's going to come to you on a flaming pie uh, in two minutes, and he's going to hit you in the face. And from then on, blue lightning bolts are going to fly from your fingertips and everyone you touch will get healed. Well, that's awesome. It sounds incredible until two minutes comes and it doesn't maybe happen. Um, I think a better way of communicating things like that would be, hey, I don't know why, but I feel like God wants to target you, Dano. And I'd pay attention to this specific date or does this specific date or time mean anything to you? I think those are great things. I think with uh, the idea of no dates and mates uh, or babies and, and mates, really on that thing, it it's such a life changing moment and life altering deal I just had a daughter who got married. Now, I didn't want to tell my daughter who to marry. I wanted to tell my daughter a value system for the type of man to marry. And I think God has an opinion on that. But I think there's multiple choices and you've got to choose that person. So a, a prophetic word over a person can't be the only thing we are using to judge whether or not we're supposed to marry a person because there's been too many messes with that. And you saw in, in you see in the Bible with the Shunammite woman when she gets prophesied a baby, right? She she gets po prophesied this baby, and she's like, "No, no, no! Don't get my hopes up." It sounds like yeah. she's actually heard that before. Yeah, exactly. And, he, and she's saying, "Don't do that." Well, it winds up happening. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm saying you that's probably reserved for the office of a prophet. And if it's not reserved for there, you know, later on, he had to raise that son from the dead when he died. So as long as you're raising people from the dead on a regular basis, I say, go ahead and prophesy babies all you want, too. So there's some of those things that we're, we're doing. We, we have little protocols like, hey, could you limit your Christian, your Christian ease, your Christian vocabulary? Why do we say that? Not because we're trying to take Christ out of anything. It's we're trying to actually speak the language of the people we're ministering to. So we wouldn't say God's given you a new wineskin if you're a guy in technology. If you're a guy in technology, we might say God's giving you 
a new operating system. So we're just using language that fits with our culture. We want to limit our our, our uh, manifestations while we're prophesying because sometimes my manifestations can be a distraction to what God is doing. So there's there's a bunch of things like that that are are regular and these are things that we're going to hit on in school of prophets and and we regularly try to help people define and cultures define. Hey Dano, that's good, Ben. What practical steps can churches take to establish and enforce guardrails? I, I wrote this down. What team wrote this down? Like, like, how do you practically enforce these, you know, guardrails? Like, you know, is it you take someone off the team if they get it wrong? You know, how, how, you know, it's like you know what I'm saying. It's like we have, you know, the repeated offender list, right? We all have the repeated offender list if we're pastoring prophetic people long enough, you have a pr repeated offender list, which is, you know, the person who just does not, like, well, let's say, doesn't listen, doesn't, you know, doesn't, doesn't adhere to any of the prophetic protocols, and maybe doesn't even seem to be under any button's authority. Like, what, how do you reinforce some of these guardrails that Ben's talking about? Well, I think the first thing is that everybody in the community has to be clear on what the protocols are. And uh, in that way, somebody doesn't feel singled out because we're saying, hey, these are the protocols that we've all agreed upon as a community. And then I like to find out why is it hard for you to follow this protocol? There's always yeah, what's an your problem? What is your problem? <laughs> yeah, yeah. In a way... Um, but oftentimes there's a belief system that every time they feel a prompting, they actually have an assignment from Holy Spirit to share everything they're seeing, hearing, or feeling. And, uh, and they think that that is being obedient to Holy Spirit. They don't understand that the same Holy Spirit that gives the gift of prophecy gives the fruit of self-control. And yeah. that 1 Corinthians 14 talks about, hey, if if one person is prophesying and another, uh, the word comes to them, the first person should stop. And the implication is really like stop mid-sentence and trust that the Holy Spirit will finish the word through somebody else. It's like this trust that Holy Spirit is in all of us. And so honestly, you know, part of that enforcing the protocols before it becomes a government issue, we have to find out what the underlying issue is of why they don't feel they can abide by these rules. Is there an underlying belief system of, and oftentimes it is that sense of, wow, every, you know, if, if I feel something, I want to be obedient to God and I have to be more obedient to God than man. And people don't, they think that they'll grieve the Holy Spirit by not sharing it when in actuality they grieve the Holy Spirit by sharing it. Mm. And yeah, that's, that's good. Yeah. You always have the person who needs attention too, and has, you know, uh, emotional uh, needs, you know, needs of the soul that aren't met. And, you know, as we're talking about prophetic communities that Ben's, you know, Ben's emphasizing here, it's like, well, being in community means, you know, you got, you're, you're actually shepherding someone tri-dimensionally, spirit, yeah. soul, and body. And if you have somebody who maybe spiritually is, you know, a, is brilliant, but maybe they're emotionally not the most intelligent person in the world, um, you know, I think that part of helping them become a healthy person is is mirroring back like hey i don't know what you think you're doing but here's the way it feels when you do that you know you get somebody i mean common things in small groups or one person dominates the whole group has got the answer for everybody yeah. um or you know one person uh becomes the victim and you know they they all they all have a story about how nobody likes them. I mean, all of these things are things that we're pastoring in, yeah. in, in prophetic communities, right? Yeah. And I think Chris and, and Dana, you, I think we can communicate as well to people uh, about protocols and about boundaries, because 
I think there's a um, a worldly view around boundaries. Boundaries are meant to control me, right? And that's the world's view. It's like, I don't want to be controlled. I want freedom. And so they don't like boundaries. But in the kingdom, boundaries are meant to promote you. And so when we, we look at boundaries, it says the shepherd comes in through the sheep gate. That, that means there's actually boundaries. And if someone comes in through another way, they're a thief. And, and it says the sheep recognize the shepherd's voice as well. So boundaries are there and boundaries help. Uh, number one, they help uh, a person learn the community learn what's what 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 are our what is our dna what are what's our value system what are our core values how do we live in this family right in the valentin family in in the mccullum family what you've got a last name uh, this is how we behave it may be different in another family but in this family this is how we behave and then uh, i i think what it also does it allows that person Boundaries allow me to to be known by the community. If I work within that, then the community sees me. The community now gets a value system for me because they you've operated. And then also leaders get to see you working within that. And that those two prong, you know, growing in in favor with both God and man is super important. But favor with man is two prong. It's your community and your leadership. So we need both in order to be promoted. And so if we can communicate that to, to our people as well, I think they'll have less anxiety when they bump up against boundaries uh, because they actually realize, oh, this is for my promotion. Yeah. I love that too, because well, you, you just made a point that I hadn't thought of. If the Lord comes through the sheep gate, that means he honors he he honors the fences. Yeah, which is your analogy for boundaries. Like the Lord isn't blasting through your fence. He's coming mm-hmm. through he's coming through what's designed to be an access point. When unhealthy people, metaphorically speaking, are often jumping over the fence or they're blasting through the fence. And, and and they they become uh you know an intruder as opposed to someone who's invited into our lives and so I love that analogy I, I've never heard that before but and it's really important Chris too because it says the sheep know the shepherd's voice and if they hear a stranger's voice they'll actually run away from it and so some of our our most powerful they are they've got a gift from God but they haven't built the the trust in the community or with leaders. And so people are running away from their voice and they're like, but I hear from God. Well, you need both. You need to hear from God and you need to honor the boundaries. That's so good. Really good. Yeah. You know, I think that all of this, you know, some, some people are hearing from God but I do think that part of what we're teaching in School of the Prophets and developing healthy communities is like, how do I actually judge if that's the voice of the Lord? If it's the, <laughs> you know, if it's the voice of my human spirit, which is probably the most difficult, or even a strategy uh, and a voice from a demonic realm, which I, I think it's important for people to realize that when the devil speaks to Christians, He's not wearing a rubber red suit and horns. You know, he's called an angel of light. And I think it's really important. I was just dealing with this uh, really recently where a, a, re- a, a friend of mine is had all these prophetic words about this prophetic about this particular direction, but the direction looks really unhealthy. And I, I was laying awake the other night, and I'm like, because this person has such a high value for prophetic ministry— how would the enemy actually manipulate this person into, you know, a bad, a bad situation? And so, and I, and I think that, I think it's not uncommon, for example, in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 6, there's a prophetess, I think her name's Nodadiah, that's saying something like, you need to go in the temple and hide in there because they're coming to kill you at night. And so there's this, 
like sense of protective spirit anointing that's like giving him direction to save his life. And then he he doesn't feel good about that word. And he he actually asked himself a question. Should a man like me flee? And so she's like, hey, I'm trying to protect you with this prophetic declaration. If you hide in the temple because they're coming to kill you, you'll be safe. Mm -hmm. Seemingly like a good, wise prophetic direction. But he notices in her prophetic declaration, something doesn't set right with him. And, and then he says to himself, should a man like me flee? So he has this revelation that, yes, at times, like Jesus told, I'm sorry, the father told Jesus to flee. Like he told Joseph and Mary, get out of this city and go to another one. Yeah. And so there is a time to flee. But he senses that this prophetic declaration doesn't feel like the Lord. And mm -hmm. so he says, listen, I don't know if a man like me should flee. And so the the counter to the prophetic de declaration of hide in the temple is you're, you're a man of God who I protect. And that's his counter to the this. What, and then he says this. So he goes, should a man like me flee? I will not flee. And then his next, the next verse says, then I discern that this was not the word of the Lord. Like yeah. when he decided to not flee, when he when he pushed into his prophetic um, identity, he could. It was like he put on these glasses that goes, "Oh, that's not the Lord." He didn't know it wasn't the Lord until he actually took on his prophetic. Uh, identity. Yeah. And I feel like, and, and, and let me finish this, I guess I, I have to finish this thought. I feel like there is, the pollution of the prophetic ministry is pretty big right now. And and Ben, we just had a little, on the SLT, I think you were, I can't remember if you were home yet or not. I think you were. But there there is a, there's a distortion of prophetic ministry right now where I'm watching some of my friends in the name of I got a word from the Lord end up in these really crazy situations. And I'm like, we're going to have to back up and ask ourselves, like, how do we judge prophetic words? Because yeah. it can't just be, is it biblical or not? Because I could say tons of things that are biblical, but they're actually not prophetic for, for your purpose. Yeah. How... What do you guys think about that? Like, I, I know you're experiencing the same thing because it, it's kind of ramped up in the last few years that people are being prophetically manipulated. They're being prophetically directed by people who don't have a great reputation in God, I mean, and who are are, are actually, their motivation is fear or, or, manip, or manipulation controlling the person. What do you think about that and how do we... Like, what are the protocols for judging prophetic ministry? Mm. Yeah, you know, we use four simple protocols. We say, first of all, that no prophetic word will ever counter scripture. You might not have a scripture for everything, but it won't be counter to scripture. Secondly, it won't counter the character and nature of God. It should sound like something God would say. The third is personal resonance, but here's the most, uh, and that just means that the Holy Spirit inside of you should be witnessing with what the Holy Spirit is saying through someone else. Yeah, but good. the fourth one I think is the most important, and that is in 1 Corinthians 14, it says, let two or three prophesy and let the rest weigh carefully what is said. And we say that the fourth way of judging prophecy is to test it in the company of loved ones and leaders. And I think whenever you have a word that is directional in nature, in other words, it's a change of course, a change of geography, a change of vocation, a shifting or redefining of a relationship, 
You want to check that with loved ones and leaders. The book of Proverbs is so strong on this. It yeah. says nobody yeah. goes to war without seeking counsel. It says nobody builds a building without first uh, seeking counsel. And I think we've lost this sense of the counsel of the Lord in judging prophecy, especially when it has to do with a change of direction. And so there is a clear theme throughout Scripture that when you're shifting directions, you seek the counsel of loved ones and leaders around you. You seek the counsel of the elders. And what that might look like is this. You say, hey, this is the word I heard. This is what I think it means. And this is what I'm thinking of doing in response to that. How does all that way out with you. And so we want them to judge the word. We want them to judge the interpretation and we want them to judge the application. All three of those elements are important to staying out of deception. That's, yeah. that's really good. And your community, especially family and close friends, I, I like to throw in there uh, a little bit of a shared value system. You want, you definitely want a shared value system. And we throw that in just because our culture at Bethel, we have people who come in and their, their family and friends don't think they should be, uh, you, you know, they're at a cult or whatever it is, you know. So uh, we, we definitely want and, and, and need that feedback. But what friends and family do, they know my soul's desire. They, they know what I've been dreaming about, thinking about, and then I have a prophetic dream that I think is prophetic, but it, it, that's scary, you know, when people are having, well, I got this word, and I had this dream, and, you know, I, I, the Bible says pretty clearly, I think it's in Thessalonians and in Jude, but on the strength of the dreams you make yourselves have, you prophesy. That's like you're you're just meditating on things and you're desiring it and then you're making it happen and then you're proof texting. Everything proves that thing. So I, I love all of those those components that Dano brought forth because those help test that. Um, yeah. And then I, I, the last one that we always add on because we are in learning process, uh, we we add time as the uh the other thing because over time i recognize yeah that was the word of the lord or nope that wasn't the word of the lord and uh and sometimes it, when we're judging the prophetic it it's it, we ha we have to judge it over a span of time to recognize it what it was it right or was it wrong and then we want to go back and review what did that feel like? What was different about that than, than this so that we can get better and quicker at recognizing the word of the Lord in the future? You know, I love uh, Bill and I were coming home from uh, the mission, actually, which is in Vacaville. And we had a prayer meeting and Bill, who's you know typically very quiet, he had obviously been contemplating through uh, part of our trip you know, some, some things. And he, in his quietness, he kind of turned to me and goes, you know what that, that verse that says, a prophet has honor except for in his hometown? I'm like, yeah. He goes, I think that's the way it's supposed to be. I think everybody should have a place where they're just Chris. They're just Ben. They're just Dano. Like, you're, you know, it's like, it's great. You might be the superhero down the street or in that other country. But when you come home, like, can't, are you livable? Like, can people, do people trust you? Will anyone follow you, you know? And I think that, yep. you know, we all, all of us that travel on this call, we all travel. And so, you know, you go someplace else and you're a freaking superhero, you know? People yep. are like, they, they want they want you to sign their forehead and, you know, write over the mark of the beast and, you know, <laughs> tattoo their, your, your, your name on their arm. And it's just kind of like, you know, I'm exaggerating to be funny, but that, I mean, there's this like, there's this awe of you, you know? When you get home, you're like, uh yeah yeah take out the garbage and 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 I think uh, one of the the things that you're talking about about community Ben is that there's an importance of knowing my patterns both my healthy patterns and my unhealthy patterns yeah so that 
you know, if I'm overly ambitious and I have a prophetic word every week about a new business I'm supposed to start and, you know, five people speak into it and you're like, yeah, I've been with you 20 years. Like this is, this, this feels like you're attracting people to your desire. Not those people aren't hearing from God. They're trying to please your, you know, they're trying to feed your desire. And, and I think that, I think the idea of community that actually, like, we're talking about knowing each other out the flesh, but, I mean, spirit, but there is a piece of knowing your past present that's a little bit healthy in that when I see you get into an unhealthy pattern and you start attracting people that speak positively about your unhealthy pattern, I'm like, no, 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 time out. Yeah. You, you know, so I think that's really uh, profound and powerful. We've we got a few minutes left. Personal story. Anybody got a personal story? How to navigate pr uh, significant prophetic words and how it's impacted your life? Like, we've been talking about the actual principles of it. Anybody got a personal yeah. story about it? I, I had a prophetic word when I was young that I would uh, sit before, you know, uh, business leaders, billionaires, you know, all this thing. And, uh, you know, I think I've heard that word for a lot of people all the time. I'm from Weaverville like you, Chris. And so I, I heard that word and I thought, well, that'll have to be God because uh, I can't, I can't do that. There's no way I can make anything like that happen. Yeah. And I can remember uh, holding that in my heart and and partnering with God, God, I yeah, I you could make this happen. I can't make it happen, but help me be a good steward in the process. If there's anything I'm supposed to do, let me know. And I just continued on that road. And I I like to do that method of, uh, you know, physical obedience brings spiritual release. Bill taught us that when we were kids. Yeah. So. God, is there anything that I need to do to partner with this to help help make it happen? And so just continue to, to be faithful with what God had given me. And years later, I can remember the very first time I sat with a billionaire. It was in Dubai, I, and I was in the, the building that this company, that the guy owned. And I sat for two hours in a conversation with this guy. And there was mutual respect. It was amazing. It was an incredible conversation. His value for me in spiritual things, my value for him in the, the role of finance, and that is a spiritual thing, but it, it was it, there was mutual value. I got away from that, Chris and Dan, and I went to my bed in, my, uh, in the house I was staying, and I just wept. I wept, and I thanked God. And I was like, this is amazing, God. Only you could make this happen. Thank you so much. And then my first thought after that was, but it'll never happen again. And then God said to me, yep, you're right. And he just he just left it hanging. I, was, I said, what do you mean you're, I'm right, God? That's not you. And he says, you know, if you keep thinking that it'll never happen again, then that's exactly what'll happen or this could be your new normal. And so it was a powerful prophetic word in that it was beyond me to accomplish on my own. I, I just stewarded something and held so on good, to it man. and walked through the doors God gave me. And then even when it came to pass, I had to change a mindset that was killing the ability for that to be normal for me. God tries to actually transform us by a word so we can sustain that new normal. But I had to change my mindset and the way I talked about it. So good. Dano, last question here, closing this uh, pioneering kind of mini-series. Um, what does it mean to be a prophetic pioneer? To be a prophetic pioneer? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I do think there's a lot in the heart of the Father um, that He wants to release in the earth. And uh, I think it's, um, if we were to use 
Mary, the mother of Jesus, as a metaphor. I think it's more than saying, Lord, amen to whatever you want to do. You know, that's a surrender. It's not necessarily agreement. You know, mm. to receive from something from the Lord, the word in the Greek is the word lambano. It means to grasp with the hand. And I think sometimes pioneering is to take what's in the heart of the Father and, and be willing to be the answer to your own problem or your own prayer by the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, and so, so she good. says, may it be in me as you have said. Yeah. And I think part of prophetic pioneering is finding out what the Father wants to do, what He wants to say, and not only be willing to be the message or the messenger, but to actually be the the person that He fulfills that through. It is like a declaration of responsibility uh, in, in an area. And uh, I love how how Ryan Collins said this, uh, Chris, you partnered with him to form Bethel Tech. And and uh, he said, don't just fall in love with a problem, but fall in love with the people that the problem affects. Mm -hmm. And I think um, part of, of prophetic pioneering is not just be, having the ability to identify and amplify the problems of society, but to position yourself to watch and see what the Lord will say to these complaints and what answer we're to give and what answer we're to be. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that God is raising up a generation of those that are not amplifying the problem, but those that are accessing the solutions mm -hmm. of the treasure of wisdom and knowledge that's hidden in the person of Jesus Christ. And not just as a messenger, but actually as entering into part of those systems of solution that actually transform society. Come on. That's deep. Ben, put your, your thumbs up right now. Come on. Here we go. There it there is it right is. there. <laughs> Beautiful. Great way to close this uh, prophetic pioneers. School of Prophets coming up. Guys, I know we're all really excited about it and really been yes. preparing for months for it. August 5th through the 9th, 2024, in Reading. It's on campus and online. We're expecting, I don't know, a thousand people uh, online and on campus. Yeah. Uh, you can register at Bethel.com forward slash events. Bethel.com forward slash events. We'll, we'll actually put it in the chat so you can, you can catch it in the chat. Guys, thank you so much for being on today. Have a wonderful day. I, I, I love you both, and I'm excited for the partnership that we have with our teams, and we're going to see. I think this, this whole thing is going to blow up in a good way. Amen. Yeah. Amen. See you love soon. Love you guys. Bye now.